In this video, we've got a little problem about the product topology on an infinite dimensional topological space and how the product topology is a little bit less intuitive uh, in this context versus if you just had a product of you know, finitely many um, topological spaces. So here's the setup. So for each natural number i, let x sub i be just the real line. And let's take the topology on that copy of the real line to be the discrete topology. So I'm using this um, fancy p uh, of xi here. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the product of all these copies of the real line. So I've got this infinite dimensional product uh, of the real line here. And uh, let's let t be the product topology on this infinite product. And we'll denote the product space by x, like I said. And the question is, is t, which is the product topology, is that the same thing as just the discrete topology uh, on this infinite product? So that's what we're gonna answer. And here's a useful fact that we need in order to tackle this problem. And what we need to know is uh, in the infinite product setting, what is a basis for the product topology? So for each natural number i, let's let yi be a topological space uh, with topology fancy u of i. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna mash all these together. We're gonna take the product of all these together is what I mean. And uh, we're gonna talk about the subsets of the product of all the yi's of the following form. So that look like some kind of infinite product of sets bi, where let me tell you about these bi's. Each bi is open in the component space yi. And second, bi is actually the entire component space yi for all but finitely many i. And in a minute, I'll, uh, or in a couple minutes maybe, I'll give you another way to think about what this is trying to say. But these sets, these subsets of the product of the yi's, so those products of the bi's, uh, this forms a basis for the product topology um, in this product space. So we're gonna use this fact that I can kind of characterize again, what's a basis for the product topology look like in this infinite product setting. And again, the weird thing, the, the little bit non-intuitive thing is probably number two in green. I require that, that uh, all but finitely many of the components uh, in the product are actually just the entire component space yi. All right, so again, that's the subtlety here. So it's intuitive to think that, well, if you have an open set oi that's open in the component uh, yi, and so in other words, oi is in the topology ui for every i, then if I just take the product of all those sets, that should be open uh, in the product space yi, y1 cross y2 cross etc. So it's intuitive to think that, because that's how it works in a, like the finite case in the, in the, with a finite product, but we don't know this is true in the infinite product setting, and we don't know it's true for the product topology. And that turns out to be really just what this problem is trying to, uh, trying to highlight. And so what's the fact above say? So let me give you another way to think about the fact, like what's going on? How can I think about these sets bi and these conditions one and condition two? So the fact's trying to say that there exists some natural number n such that oi is actually equal to yi for all i greater than that index n. So like eventually, once you go far enough out uh, in that product of the bi's, they all should just become yi's. Cool. So let's go back to the problem. So what we're gonna do, uh, first we need to recall some notation. So remember like each xi is just the real line and the topology on each copy of the real line that we're gonna play with is the discrete topology. So by way of contradiction, let's go ahead and suppose that the product topology on this infinite product of the real line with itself a bunch of times uh, is the discrete topology. So let's, let's suppose they're the same. Now the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna consider the element zero comma zero comma blah, 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 blah. And so that's an element of this infinite product to the real line with itself. And uh, also what I'm suggesting is you could think of elements in that infinite product uh, just like a, as an infinite tuple. And some people think of these as like, well, this is the space of all sequences of real numbers. You can think of it that way too. So I'm just kind of saying, okay, let's take the origin in this in infinite dimensional or this infinite product. I keep saying dimensional, right? And when I say dimensional, I think linear algebra. I don't mean to bring that in with the baggage of linear algebra. Um, so excuse me for saying dimensional a bunch of times. Okay, so uh, if this infinite product actually has the discrete topology, so let's get some mileage out of assuming that we have the discrete topology. So remember that's, that's part of our contradiction hypothesis here, that the product topology is the same thing as the discrete topology in this case. Okay, so what's it being the discrete topology tell me? Well, discrete topology is lovely because that means that every subset uh, of your space is open. 
So in particular, let's just look at the singleton. So in other words, the set that just has the one element, zero comma zero, blah, blah, blah. So that thing itself is open. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite that set. So that set with one element, which is just you know the origin in my infinite product. We're just gonna pull it apart. So that's the same thing as uh, this, this, the, the origin on the first copy of the real line, Cartesian product with the origin on the next copy of the real line, Cartesian product, blah, blah, blah. So we're just constantly taking the Cartesian product of the origin on each component of the real line there. And so my point, like in yellow, is that when I take those products, it's always, you know, cross zero is next. And so what else do we know? We know that any open set can always be written as a union of basis elements in the topology. And that's, again, kind of the point of a basis of open sets. So they're kind of your basic building blocks. All the open sets in the topology in the topology can be constructed out of the ones from the basis. And so, well, if my set with a single element is open, then it should be able to be a union, able to be written as a union of basis elements. But how can I write a set with one element as a union of a whole bunch of other sets? And if you think about that, the only way to do it is if my set with one element already is a basis element. Right? If it's a unit of a bunch of other sets, the other sets can't have any other points in it besides this one point. So that means that this set has to be a basis element for the topology. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to apply the, what we know about what do basis elements for the product topology look like. So we just got a ton of mileage out of the discrete topology hypothesis. But now let's get some mileage out of the fact that we know that this is also the product topology. So since we've assumed that we're dealing with the product topology, and now I've got my hands on a basis element, and uh, again, this is just me reminding you, by way of contradiction, we have assumed that the discrete topology uh, and the product topology are the same. We've kind of exhausted the mileage we need, or we're gonna get from the discrete topology. Now we're moving on to see what can we get out of the fact that we've assumed we've also got the product topology here. So by our fact about what do basis elements for the product topology look like, that tells me that there's some index such that, well, you can take your set, but such that once you get past that index, say like the nth component, it should become R, right? It should become the entire space for that component, right? So not just a subset of that space, like an OI, like I was referring to above. Now it has to be the whole YI. So I'm trying to connect that back to what we were talking about a little bit more generally. And also, it's not just in the nth component that it's R and it goes back to being zero. It's going to be R every single time from that point onward. All right, so now let's compare now. So the set with just, you know, your infinite origin in it is a goofy way to think about that. But I know that I can pull that apart into a bunch of individual Cartesian products. That's always going to be, you know, Cartesian product, the set zero. But what we just said is that's equal to, well, the Cartesian product of zero with itself a bunch of times that eventually becomes ours, right? So if you compare both sides, of course, they're not the same thing. So that's the contradiction. And so what we just showed is that, well, that tells me the product topology on this infinite product cannot be the same thing as the discrete topology. So that answers the problem. And then what I wanted to do is just talk about a little remark, uh, say a little bit more about what's going on. And so again, just a little bit more of the weirdness. Um, why do we make uh, this assumption about the product topology? Why does it work this way? And you know, it just seems so intuitive to just, okay, uh, what's going to be open in the product? Probably just products of open sets without any restrictions about eventually you got to take the whole component space from here on out. Like that seems kind of silly. So what if you didn't have that restriction? Well, that's actually called the box topology. So if you're in a topology class, you've probably heard of that before. So the box topology on, a, on an infinite product space or really on any product space uh, is equal to, or it has basis, sorry. So it has a basis where you just take the Cartesian product of open sets from each component without any restriction. And if you think about it, the box topology is going to be the same thing as the product topology if you're only dealing with a product of finitely many topological spaces. But again, where they start to differ, where it gets weird, is in the infinite product setting. And that's what this problem just showed. So in this previous problem, we just figured out that the box topology on the whole product space, that is what would be the discrete topology. So I didn't actually show that, but I think you should think about it. But uh, what I just showed, what we did just show, is that the box topology is not going to be the same as the product topology uh, in general. And so that's what our example does. So the problem illustrates the difference between the product topology and the box topologies for infinite products.